Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now, historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. We got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting their rolling pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now. Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio. Yes, indeed, the voice of fate. We have been in publication since 1948. That is 71 years of all things strange and anomalous and true. So, thank you for joining me. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I have such a show lined up for you tonight because it's someone that I actually was fortunate enough to hear while I was producing another show. Loved his work, loved his conversation, and after a suitable time so that I didn't stomp on their show and, you know, get somebody too soon, Max Hawthorne is joining me tonight. I am thrilled, to say the least. Max, I am looking forward to to this conversation I am also a saltwater aficionado. I love to just bob, and your books have given me reason to ponder that (laughs) decision. (laughs) So welcome to Fate Radio. Thank you, Kat. It's It's a privilege to be here. Well, I'm thrilled. I have been trying to... I've been trying to read your books while contemplating taking my grandson to the beach, right? And... He's four, almost five. And truly, 
I I strap a boogie board on somewhere so that there's something bobbing around if something were to you know go awry and somebody could find me. But it is something I'm seriously contemplating. You know, what in the world are you thinking? <laughs> After reading your books, and you actually have credible possibilities in these books that that do give one pause. Well, I, I think like uh, the the type of novels I write, I guess people define them as a subgenre of horror, known as uh, quote marine terror. Mm-hmm. So that would in, invoke things like Jaws, books of that nature, you know, Benchy's work, um, Beast, you know, the giant squid as your uh, antagonist, let's say, and it really gives you so much to work with um, when you bring, like, the notion of taking fragile, land-bound human beings and putting them in a marine environment uh, without all the, the technology and the safety that we have typically on, say, dry land. You know, I mean, if people are, how fast is it, can a human being swim? You know, Not even, fast even enough. An Olympic, even an Olympic athlete, we're veritable slugs in the water. You know, we can't maneuver, we can't turn, we can't run, we can't hide. Uh, a lot of, if you're on the surface, let's say bobbing up and down, uh, you know, it's even worse because you have everything under you now where something, God forbid, could be coming and looking and exploring and, you know, ooh, is this uh, edible? You know, <laughs> it, it makes for a very frightening environment. I mean, we've a all seen movies snack. like. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you've seen the opening scene of Jaws where the poor girl was in the water and all of a sudden the shark grabs her from below. It's a terrifying prospect, and it really gives you a whole realm of possibilities to open up to draw your reader in and and really have them biting their nails as they're they're reading, you know. So it's it's cool when you can stop people from going into the water because they're at the beach reading your book. Well, I will (laughs) tell you that... Jaws did not stop me from going in the water. I go down to Gulf Shores, Alabama, Mm -hmm. and have always gone to Gulf Shores, Alabama. My daughter was a beach guard down there. There are, I mean, we we have nasty sharks. We have the ones that get their, their teeth in a twit if you, if they even perceive that you might be in their space. And of course... I have just had a, bull? a brain issue. Bull shark? Yes, thank you. It sounds like a bull shark because they're very It aggressive. is a bull shark. We also have a hammerhead. That, yeah, we have several hammerheads, but we have one that's consistently seen every day as he strolls from past Pensacola, uh, past Gulf Shores, going towards the Mobile River where it feeds, Mobile Bay feeds into the Gulf. Because there's a lot of churned up stuff there, and you can probably find a lot to eat if you're a hammerhead. But we have sharks that that will take your breath away when you see their fin in the water because they're so large. Yeah, I, I, I probably some of the same animals. I've down in the Gulf in the in the Port Charlotte area. Mm-hmm. I've fished several times with Bucky Dennis, who is the current world record holder for the Great Hammerhead. Uh, he caught like a, I fished that many years ago. That was it's still the record. I think it was fourteen and a half feet long and weighed almost thirteen hundred oh, wow. pounds. And when, when we were out there, we were actually looking to do some shark fishing the last time, but uh, they were weren't around. I mean, these this is it's kind of hit or miss. They're either there or they're yes. not. Uh, you know, the tarpon were a little weird that day. So we settled down and started doing a lot of giant grouper, you know, goliath grouper fishing instead, which, you know, was quite productive. I, I actually ended up on the news then because they weren't having any action for the tarpon fishing and stuff, you know, the tournaments. So the news crew that was on a boat there ended up filming me fighting a 300-pound grouper, you know, for, I guess, they needed something for their broadcast. <laughs> of course, they had to edit it because something happened where some colorful metaphors on my part came out of my mouth, which obviously I'm not going to say on the air. I, I almost got so injured. Much. by this. <laughs> yeah. But they, I saw the, the cameraman filming, and I saw his head pop out. They kept the, to his credit, he kept the lens on me from the boat, but mm-hmm. his head popped out, and he was like, did he just say blank, you know, whatever it was, you know, but it, it was a knee-jerk reaction, you know, you're, you're fighting this huge fish, and you've got a lap belt on, and all of a sudden the fish dove straight down and drove the butt of the rod practically into my crotch. Oh, I, well, you know, I would have said that It was that quite today. painful. Yeah, so, you know, something colorful came out, but, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing area, and the, the sharks are enormous. There's one down there that was actually the inspiration for the huge hammerhead named Bismarck that I put in like one of my recent novels. Mm -hmm. um, but this animal, according to Bucky, is 18 feet long, which means it weighs, gosh, I don't know, 2,500 to 3,000 pounds on a rough estimate. I mean, wow. it's, it's enormous. Yeah, and that's what they do, though. They follow the migrating tarpon, and that's their main food source while those fish are spawning. And the tarpon is not a small fish. I've got no, a you know, seven-footer on my wall. Yeah, so if you're a six- or seven-foot fish, you know, this is the predator feeding on it. It makes sense if you have something that size when you correlate it up. Wow. You know, I have never caught a tarpon, and they are supposed to be the most amazing fighting fish. Is that true? I... Whew, 65 minutes of... Uh, just the, the most intense physical trauma <laughs> that I had experienced up to that point. And I had caught what would have been the world record blue shark years prior, caught and released this 12-foot uh, blue shark. But mm -hmm. the uh, part of it was the rig. I mean, the, the captain I was fishing with, you know, you're using a, a big, heavy, uh, I forget which reel, was a Shimano, I think, t big tail D or lever drag or something. But uh, he didn't have a good fighting belt for this fish. So... What happened is he, he handed me this little, uh, it was like a little square, hard piece of leather with a little leather socket in it and a half-inch wide belt to go around your waist. And this is supposed to be your fighting belt. I mean, a fighting oh, belt needs that so. positioning. Yeah. So, the, you know, the stress put on it by this fish was driving this little square. It literally cut into my pelvis, and I was bleeding from it. It got to the point where I was so fed up, I yanked it off, and I threw it at the captain's head and just, like, you know, put the... Uh, the base of the rod or whatever, kind of against my uh, hip or something like that, which was a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it was a backbreaking um, struggle. I mean, the fish would, you know, you're talking about a fish that was take 50, 100 yards of line over and over again, and you're like holding on and he's towing the boat. I think our, our the fight we had with this fish ranged over about three miles. You know, it was by Bahia Honda Bridge and then went through the old bridge between the pilings and back to the original bridge. I mean, it just he never got tired. It was wow. it was exasperating and in the dark too, so oh, you know, I wouldn't have liked I'm, that in the dark. I don't think. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was just, but it was just. I, I was so impressed with the power of these fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you think he was tired? He'd come to the surface, gulp air, give us the fin, as I like to put it, you know, and then he would tear another fifty yards of line off, and you were like, is this thing ever gonna lay up? You know, but fortunately, it all worked out. And, you know, we released him at boat side. And I had, like, uh, one hand that was permanently, like, crooked for the next three days and couldn't yes. move. And the other one I couldn't pick up coins with. You know, my grip was so exhausted from fighting this fish. But it was a great story, you know. It was a great it experience. It was a great story. And he was how, and it, how much did he weigh? 170 pounds. Unbelievable. For the keys, that's a big fish. That's a big you know, fish, in Boca, yes. Yeah. In Boca Grande, the females are around that size, maybe 150 to sometimes 200. But down in the keys, I think they're more like 70 to 90 pounds. So one that weighs a little over 170 pounds, like pushing seven feet, for that area is very, very large. So Why are they so cool. much larger in Boca Grande? I think it's because it's the spawning season where all the big females congregate you know, for mating. They kind of migrate through and through the paths, so they're much more condensed, let's say. When you're down in the Keys, I think you have all different sizes. You know, like if you're fishing bass on a pond, you might have your, your two- and three-pounders or, you know, your predominant fish. Sometimes, rarely, you find a five or six, and maybe once in that five-acre pond in one spot, there might be a 10-pounder lurking somewhere. So it's kind of that same type of thing in a larger section of ocean, whereas if you've got mating season going on, all the big breeders, you know, their brood stock, let's call it, are coming from hundreds and thousands of miles to migrate through there, and you've got them much more condensed. Well, and not only that, to the, I would assume that the ones getting to the area to spawn actually are, and are the ones Carrying that with kind eggs. of win to get there mm. and to get into oh, you the mean breeding. The, yeah. The alphas. The fittest. Yeah. 
I, I think that that's probably a, a choice thing too. Maybe it's a, they're like salmon genetically programmed to return to the same region. I just know that I've seen like like the charts, and you could watch like the tarpon tournaments down there, and they actually have uh, this contraption they hook up where they can weigh the fish and then mm-hmm. release it alive. And you can see the numbers of how big they are. And, you know, most of the fish are 150 pounds or so. Sometimes you get a 160, 170. Occasionally you get one that's 200 or even 210. They're enormous. But, uh, you know, and then, of course, you've got these huge 500, 600, 700-pound bull sharks that are following along and feeding on them. And then, of course, the alphas, which are these giant hammerheads. There, It's, you know, it's a dangerous spot if yes. you think about it. Yes. I mean, like, you wouldn't want to fall in the water. You know, I, I've seen, like, the signs, like, at the pass there, you know, on shore, it says, like, danger, riptides, you know, no swimming. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's just riptides that people are worrying about. You know, you've got huge predatory fish out there that are feeding on tarpon that are as big as a person. If a person goes in the water, you know, and there's a bleeding tarpon was just in that area or something like that, God forbid, you know, the shark could mistake a person for a tarpon being with a similarity in size. You know, so you definitely don't want to take a chance and be swimming out there when it's spawning season for them. Well, in no, my humble opinion, and you know, like with the bull sharks and everything else in our area, the first the first time I saw something actually break completely out of the water was in Perdido Pass in Orange Beach. That was a tarpon, and he was not very big the part you know based on what i saw but what came behind him and got him was and that was just kind of like holy wow and right behind that there was a um a bird swimming it was a pelican and he Mm. got got and i was just like wow i think i'm good now (laughs) yeah i'm kind of done but that was my first time, and I was, I was pretty young. And then, you know, when I go out with friends, and my husband doesn't like big water, so my boat doesn't go out past the pass. But, um, you know, when you see all the cobia and the jacks and the turpins, and it's just like, those are big fish, but they are nowhere near big fish. And when you were riding, you know, we're talking 165 pounds, 200 pounds, 250 pounds. You're riding 100 tons, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, if we're looking at the, uh, I mean, I have a lineup of dump trucks. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, I like to mix it up. I mean, I know there was some, a large, in the first novel, there was a very large sperm whale that was part of the story. Um, I incorporated a colossal squid. Of course, the enormous Chronosaurus Imperator Pliosaur, that is the, uh, the namesake for the book, Cronus mm-hmm. Rising. Um, some orcas. But yeah, I really got to incorporate a lot of the city's ultimate marine predators in one big book. You know, obviously interacting with the, the, uh, hapless primates, let's say, that are trying to survive through all this. Well, when you first sat down and started going, hmm, I'm interested in these things. I'm interested in marine life. I'm interested in the possibilities of these things being out there. Mm -hmm. I bet I could write a book that would make Jaws look like a kindergarten coloring book. (laughs) You know, <laughs> poor Mr. Benchley. But, well, Jaws um, is, I'm sorry, guys. No, go ahead. No, Jaws is kind of like the inspiration for so many writers. I mean, whether yes. it's the book, the movie, or a combination thereof, you know, you've got this ultimate story, man versus nature, man versus his own nature, man versus man a little bit, mm-hmm. in this type of story. And it, it's such a, a, a poignant tale. You know, and of course, it's become like the benchmark. And you know, you've seen it in Jurassic World, mm-hmm. where to create this ultimate marine predator, they always try and target something preying on a great white shark, let's say, to emphasize how huge and powerful and deadly and dangerous this new, more formidable marine predator is. You know, we, we've seen it happen in 
Jaws books. Um, we've seen it. Ha- I mean, it, it took place in Cronus Rising. I had a 23-foot female great white shark that was on the verge of starvation that wandered into Paradise Cove and mistakenly interpreted some of the people swimming there as um, the, the pinnipeds, the seals that they typically feed on. Right. You know, now you have a 23-foot, 6,000-plus-pound great white. is a huge animal. It's pretty much the size of the shark in Jaws. And it was a really, like one of the, my, my fans' favorite scenes where there's a press conference going on where there, the sheriff, Jake Braddock, and the marine biologist, Amara Takagi, who's with him, they're trying to present to the media the possibility that they have this, there's a prehistoric marine reptile on a loose. They even have a tooth from it. Oh, <clears> but God. of course, they're met with, they're met with derision and abuse, et cetera, and heckling and catcalls and all this stuff. And then you hear this high-pitched screaming in the background, which is the poor girl, a teenage girl, that was attacked by this shark. And the shark has made its you know, initial bite and is now circling her, waiting for her to bleed out before it comes in the feed. And then Jake, oh, of course... you know what? I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. That's okay. But we have to take this break, and that's a good place to stop because I don't want to... I want to hear this, and I don't want to have to stop again. <laughs> So bear with me, and we will be right back after this. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. To the believer. The evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello, everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTV, and produced by WBHMDB.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so pleased to have you here because this is a fantastic show. And we're just getting started. I mean, these are going to be some exemplary tales, experiences, stories, call it what you will. But I interrupted Max on one. And if you have questions, though, you can go to your Spreaker app if you're mobile 
and search WBHM-DB and you will find us, Fate Mag Radio. If you are, or just Fate Radio, it'll come up either way. If you are not mobile and are listening on our websites, either FateMag.com or WBHMDB-DB.com, we have a chat room there too. It's just the little thing that looks like it would be a cartoon over your head. So come on in, bring the questions, and this is going to be great. And Max Hawthorne, I had to interrupt you to, to take that break. We were actually a little late getting out, but I had to find a decent place to stop. And at this point, you had a shark that had gotten into Paradise Cove, had attacked a young woman who was in trouble. And he was just waiting on her to become his tasty snack. I hate when that happens. I know, but, right? It can ruin a day. So, yeah, so basically, and this is, you know, if somebody hasn't read the first Cronus Rising novel at this point, um, it's going to be a bit, of, <clears throat> a bit of a spoiler, unfortunately. But uh, so what happened at this, at this time is Jake, you know, they, they hear the screaming, the people on the beach, the, the media, et cetera. Jake runs down the beach tossing his shoes and shirt, dives into the water to try and save this young woman. And when he gets there, he sees that she's suffered a horrific bite on her hip from an enormous great white shark. And the shark is circling them now. And usually when somebody tries to rescue someone that's been hit by a a great white, the rescuer from statistically is usually ignored by the shark. It's focused on the person it struck and mm-hmm. waiting for them to expire. That's what they do with a seal or sea lion, typically. So in this case, though, Jake's trying to get her to safety to shore, but the animal keeps cutting them off and moving closer and closer. It's not acting normal, and they're in serious trouble. So it comes after them, finally, makes a direct charge. And Jake, being the hero, of course, he decides to try and sacrifice himself, and he is prepared to hoist the girl up out of the water and toss her out of the way and actually let the fish come after him instead. And right as this is about to happen and the the shark is closing for the kill, it stops mysteriously, like boom, like it hit an invisible wall. And it's just looking at him from like three feet away and he's totally confused about what's going on. Then the water around the shark starts to boil and turn and then he, he looks around, he sees this huge shadow behind the fish and he realizes that something much, much bigger has actually seized the shark. And he starts, he turns and he starts swimming for it to try and get away from what's about to happen. And as he's watching, this great white shark gets slowly lifted up out of the water bit by bit by bit. And then the head of this 25 meter, 80 foot pliosaur that has its entire tail and rear quarters in its mouth raises the shark up out of the water. So it's like, not only is it proving to the world yet, yes, this thing does exist, haha, but in such a dramatic fashion that it just it's a, a terrifying visual and the reptile of course cares nothing about the people around it they're like insects before it mm-hmm. and, you know, where it came from it was basically a god on its island and then it starts doing what it, it would uh, any big predator would do in a situation like that where you're killing a dangerous fish it starts smashing the shark on the water like to break its back and immobilize it so that it doesn't get bitten when it goes to ingest it so all this is going on and jake's trying to get the safety and you know, the, the people are getting washed off a nearby pier from the, the waves that are being created by this. And it just makes a really great reveal to, to present your monster to the world and, to the, and even with TV cameras on it. Movie, you know, I mean, not movie cameras, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a, an impressive sight, like, uh, sight, I guess you'd say, or scene, set piece. So, you know, if the book does become a film at any point, they should definitely leave that in. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, how else are you going to introduce them? a monster so and actually it wasn't being a monster then it was being a natural animal who was inadvertently saving someone i think that's pretty awesome yeah i mean these are real creatures or they were obviously they during were. the Mesozoic. Yes. so i mean these you know, these were the ultimate marine predators these pliosaurs you know i mean there's been all this focus you know in books and TV, movies, and movies, for, you know, about the megalodon shark. But the truth of the matter is, is that the giant marine reptiles, and the pliosaurs in particular, were the ultimate marine predators, the biggest, the baddest, the fastest, the most dangerous. You know, if they hadn't gone extinct, 
at the end of the Mesozoic, you know, there wouldn't be any of the even the great white sharks that we have today wouldn't exist because they'd eaten all the big sharks out of existence by the end of the Cretaceous. There literally were no large predatory sharks left then. The mosasaurs were everywhere, eating everything. Wow. So I yeah, didn't you're, you're actually asteroid. realize that. Yeah, these uh, you know this this whole thing with these the megatooth sharks and everything they evolved from a small like nine foot species that was left over and survived the Cretaceous extinction. You know the KT impact, the asteroid, and all that. And yes. those small predatory sharks grew over time without any competition. They were able to start taking over those ecological niches and getting larger and larger, thirty feet, forty feet, topping out a little over fifty feet eventually in the Miocene and stuff. So. Asteroids change worlds. <laughs> Do they ever? Yeah, uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that asteroid. That's true. And, you know, I have fairly recently been researching this because I was, you know, the l first time that we were in Arizona, my husband saw the, we were on our way to the Painted Desert, my husband saw the meteor crater <laughs> sign. And our day was made, <laughs> right? Oh, because he the one always that took a mile. To there. Yeah, that mile and, wide one. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So I started researching because I knew that wasn't big enough to have been the the epicenter of what took everything out. And I found it really ugly of the people that were mocking the the researchers, saying, "Oh, really?" There is no way that this happened. Da -da 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 -da. And show us a crater. Well, lo and behold, let's hit South America and see if we can't find this one. And that whole period just really fascinated me because you know, just like sometimes with what I research and investigate, you know, there's a lot of naysaying and mocking, whether it's ufology or, you know, spiritual, paranormal or whatever. And there's usually answers if people will just open their minds a little bit and listen. And that's kind of like was faced with this extinction event, mm -hmm. a global extinction, extinction event that people were just kind of like, Nah, it wasn't that big of a meteor. You're crazy. And I digress. I'm sorry. No, it's it's uh, the, but, that the chi the Chicxulub crater. <clears throat> I mean, I keep you know you, they keep giving different reports, like estimates change over time. But now they're saying is that that asteroid or comet could have been anywhere from nearly seven to fifty miles in diameter, and the crater that it left behind. I've heard estimates of. I mean, it shrunk, you know, over the eons. There were multiple, like, uh, I don't know what you call them, but uh, expansions of it, let's say. Some many wish, like, the rings that, that eventually a lot of them collapsed. But even now, I think it's still, like, 90-something miles in diameter. And I've seen estimates where it was 130 or even 190 miles, I think, was one across. So it was an enormous, enormous, devastating blow to the planet, kind of like, a, like a, something the size of a basketball getting hit by a bullet. You know, that, that yeah. shock travels through the planet's core, sets off earthquakes and volcanoes planet-wide. I mean, you're talking Armageddon. In fact, that's what I called it. I named it Armageddon in the book because I did Cretaceous flashback scenes in my first novel, which was a really cool thing for the readers. I know you read it, but, uh, you know, it let you people go flash back and forth from the present to 65, 66 million years ago, setting up everything for this asteroid impact and whatnot, because that asteroid impact and the effects it had was what enabled me to imprison, you know, all the marine life that I needed for my story so that it could be believable and be, exist in the present day. Yes. You, you really want realism for your readers. You know, you need that suspension of disbelief. That's my favorite part. I mean, very, a lot of people are really good authors, but it is really special when you find yourself like two hours later or three hours later and you realize that you probably should have been asleep about that far back <laughs> and you're still there. So Yes, I um, get blamed by that sometimes. Well, I meant to talk to you about that, but uh. I tease. 
kind of, a little bit. If I, I had get into a corporate structure, mm-hmm. I would, I would have been not a hundred percent. It's great though yeah. because you do do a good job with something well, that it, fascinates me. It's flattering when you have the ability to keep people turning the pages. I mean, that's the mark of a good story and of a good storyteller. And I'm, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I mean, we all strive for that when you're a writer. If you don't accomplish it, you lose your writer. I mean, your writer, your reader. And, you know, God forbid they don't go back or even finish the book. You know, I've, I've read books where I was like, yeah, right, that's not. And I would throw the book in the trash. I mean, literally, I hate to say it, but if you can't not only hold my interest, but if, if you're telling me a story that's so ridiculous and so unbelievable mm-hmm. that I, I can't buy into it by any stretch, you know, people want that. And, and you know, readers hold their their authors and their filmmakers to a higher standard, I think, today than they ever had with all the media that we have at our fingertips, you know, the Google research and everything else under the sun. You know, if something doesn't feel right and people research it, they're like, aha, that's not right. That meteor wasn't traveling at 50,000 miles an hour, Max. What are you talking about? Nice try. I'm not buying into it. You know, this type of stuff. So, um, <laughs> Do people yeah, actually but, write you and tell you things like that? Um, it's usually the, the meteor stuff I've never had an issue with. You know, they, I, I did a lot of research on the Chicxulub impact and the asteroid, etc. I was really able to recreate hell on Earth for that. You know, nobody's ever questioned it. They've all loved that aspect of the story. You know, sometimes they try and question things like, oh, well, uh, those marine reptiles weren't that big or, or one that made me laugh. They, they, marine reptiles, prehistoric, you know, plesiosaurs and plesiosaurs, they didn't act like that. That wasn't their behavior. Oh, you were there? I'm sorry. Did you did you take <laughs> notes and make take film of this? I'd really like because to see I it. I would like to review that. Let's yeah, bring the you know. Videotape. But yeah, you really but you really want to try and you know you, you want to have that suspension of disbelief. You know, I've had people question, oh, uh, great white shark. You got a twenty three foot great white shark. They don't get that big. They do get that. They big. They do get fact, that big, and they and get bigger. that they're, big, and mm-hmm. they're close to shore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's proof. There's the whale carcasses where they've measured bite marks on them that prove that there are great white sharks that exceed 25 feet. Mm-hmm. See, but you know, you always have these people that you know. Uh, there's some people that just aren't happy, maybe in their own lives, if they can't needle somebody else or something. You can't please everybody, you know. So you shoot for pleasing as many people as possible, and then you do what you have to do. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I. I was fortunate to have somebody who taught me that when I was very young. Mm. And it was a good thing. It has stood me yeah. well. Yeah, that that asteroid thing, though. It really, you know, not to, I mean, like, that, believe it or not, that was really one of the things that got me into writing the very first Cronus Rice novel in the first place was researching asteroids and finding out about the effects of what they would have had. And one of the things that the Chicxulub impact had was it created immense tidal waves. Some estimates have been a thousand yards or more in height. I mean, picture a 3,000 foot wave, you know, twice the size, more than twice the size of the Empire State Building. That's an enormous wave. And knowing that it was, you know, off the coast of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula and whatnot near Cuba, et cetera. And it really was able to be a perfect setup for me because I wanted to create, like, like well, let's say, there's been so many stories over the years in movies and books where people wanted to have a prehistoric animal or animals, um, you know, uh, alive now in the present, like the lost world with the plateau and all that. I mean, it goes all the way back to that. And those were great books, and that was a great you know, and plausible idea where you could have an isolated plateau where prehistoric li- you know, animals could be alive to the present day. You know, King Kong, Skull Island, this type mm-hmm. of thing, etc. You know, I wanted to create something more, though, because my focus was really on marine life. So it's like, well, if you have like these giant 75, 80-foot sometimes marine monsters swimming around to the present, why is nobody ever seeing them? You know, you want to have like an isolated thing. And people have done different versions. You know, there's been everything from they, they live in the, you know, the deep water trenches. Uh, you know, what was that author's name? Um, 
Oh my God! Oh, I can't it was think the very, of that either. But I, I know the, the very book. first book. Robin Robin Brown, I think it was, put out the very first Megalon book, like in 1980 yes. or 81, and his, you know story behind it was that in the deep water abysses, these megalon sharks had taken shelter and they had lived out their lives there and they had evolved and that's where they were. Okay. So you had like, uh, people have had prehistoric creatures frozen in ice and icebergs and freed by, you know, radioactive testing. I mean, there's been everything under the sun. I wanted something plausible and believable. And And so what I did was, yeah, I took that, that this, this a caldera. I called it Diablo Caldera. I created this caldera off the coast of Cuba. And for anybody who might not know, a caldera is basically a volcano that has had such a, an enormous eruption millions of years typically earlier that it's blown off the top two-thirds or more of its stack, let's say the cone, is all gone. And all that's left is this huge bowl-shaped depression remaining. And to me, that was like perfect for setting up, what, a giant fishbowl. You know, I needed an enormous fish tank, let's say. So I had this set up off the coast of what would one day be Cuba during the Cretaceous. And when the asteroids struck and created these immense waves where they they were actually swept up miles and miles and miles and miles of ocean and swamped, actually overwhelmed, went over and swamped this caldera and then kept going and leaving behind a gigantic, instantaneous saltwater lake, create complete with, I'm sorry, a whole ecosystem of animals. You know, because you can't just imprison a a big predator or two and say, okay, you guys are going to live here for 65 million years. You know, they have to have something to eat. Exactly. Yeah, so I had, you know, the the prehistoric fish and squid and all this, you know, other other marine life in there. Obviously a big death toll from the impact of being, you know, you can't just get swept up by a tiger and crash into a, a mountain and expect everything to live. You know, but it worked out nicely. And then giving, using geothermal heating, I was able to explain how these animals could survive the, you know, impact winter that came from the Chicxulub impact, you know, so they didn't freeze to death, how they could withstand the ice ages that came after that, et cetera. You know, it let me create this plausible, believable story of how some of these this species and other species could stay in prison for so many eons to the present, to the point where eventually, like a... a earthquake or tremor would split open part of the caldera temporarily because I didn't want everything to get out, you know, so a little rock slide action and close that up. But anyway, and that's where our story was able to, you know, it was more backstory, I guess you'd say, you know, uh, you don't want to give it away at the beginning of the story. Thank you. But that's why the whole Cretaceous flashback scenes were important, not just to figure out what this thing was when, you know, late in the game, to introduce it from its, its original domain, let's say, during the Cretaceous ruling those oceans, but you know, explaining how, bit by bit, teasing it out for readers so that by the time they finish the book, they're like, oh my God, so that's how they stayed in there. That's how they stayed alive. And you leave people with such a sense of belief that they start wondering, well, could that be going on now? You know, Is there an environment like that that we haven't found yet? It's, it's good stuff mm-hmm. for me. I think that that is perfectly plausible. That's why I think this was such a brilliantly done book. Because, you you know, I have, well, you know, that I have recently gotten just mesmerized by the plesiosaurs. That's how I say that, right? Or the plesiosaurs? Plesiosaurs, yes. Mm-hmm. And, Pliosaurs are the ones that are in the book. Plesiosaurs is the whole, like, in other words, if, if you have cats... Like a, a, a pliosaur would be like a lion would be to a cat in terms right. of the species in general. Well, well yeah, you know, I interviewed um, Scott Martis and other people relevant to this, and it has just it has just taken off. You know, the things that I'm learning, the things that I'm reading. I heard you, and I was like, oh, he knows this stuff too. I definitely want to talk to him. And, you know, it's just a, it's just an amazing adventure going through and learning these things and, you know, seeing how there is a possibility that these might actually possibly still be here. So it just blows my mind. And we have to take another break. If you'll just hang with me for a second. Guys, we will be right back. Thanks for being here, and this is just going to get better. Come on back. 
You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Abnormal Alabama presents Crypticon, October 25th and 26th, at the Bard in the Wharf, Orange Beach. Bigfoot, the paranormal, authors and speakers, vendors, and your chance to experience the Psychomantium. There'll be a costume contest and much, much more. October 25th and 26th, at the Bard in the Wharf, Orange Beach. Get more info, directions, and tickets available now at AbnormalAlabama.com. That's AbnormalAlabama.com. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. We are back here on Fate Magazine Radio with... Max Hawthorne, and I am sorry I had to stop you. (laughs) I am having a hard time making myself stop for breaks because I find this fascinating. But please do continue. Oh, sure. Well, you you were touching on the notion about could any of these animals be alive today? Um, As far as we know, pliosaurs themselves, these gigantic sort of like, how can I say this? If you picture like an enormous crocodile with a short tail and four large flippers instead of legs, that's sort of like what you'd have when you were looking at different types of pliosaurs. Okay. They went extinct um, the, around the Cenomanian. I think it was a, there was a, a, a big uh, extinction event that wiped out the ichthyosaurs, which are like these prehistoric marine reptiles that look like big dolphins. And these were their main prey for those animals, it looks like. And once the ichthyosaurs went extinct, the pliosaurs died off almost immediately. And then mosasaurs took over. So as far as we know, mosasaurs and long neck plesiosaurs were the ones that were still alive at the end of the Cretaceous when the impact took place. So if you had any big marine predators, reptilian ones around, it would be more likely a mosasaur or a plesiosaur of some kind, like a long neck one, still alive, let's say, in today's oceans. Um, and, And there's been a lot of sightings to corroborate that including somebody I interviewed recently. Who did you interview recently? Um, there was a, a, a gentleman from the UK, Paul George. Mm. We did a, a, a lot of uh, talking back and forth. Um, he was working back in 2014, I think it was. He worked on the Carnival Cruise Lines as a trainer, the Carnival Breeze. And he was called, he was up on deck, on the top deck, and... Uh, so I just came back from a cruise a few weeks ago, so I, I could really talk about this. But uh, And I saw his ship, the ship that he was on, in in uh, Port Canaveral, the Carnival Breeze. I, was, I took a picture that. of it. Yeah. So what had happened is a, a bunch of, like a half dozen patrons, let's say, um, passengers, you know, were up on the top deck, and they called them over, and they said, what is this animal down there? You know, they wanted to know because they couldn't identify it. And he looked, and this is a guy who was, you know, on the ship for a long time, and he'd seen different whales and dolphins and sharks and all this other stuff, you know, swimming next to the ship, in front of the ship, et cetera. This was none of those. And he described, all he saw was its head, neck, and let's say its upper back, like part of its back. And this thing was swimming along next to the carnival breeze. He said, keeping pace with it easily, which is impressive because the cruise liners, they were yeah, they run like 20, 21 miles an hour, 
when they're underway, you know, when they're not in a hurry. Um, and he described it as being utterly gigantic. He said it was so big that it, it periodically broke the surface, like its back and stuff, and the water came off its back like it was a submarine, and it was that large. And he described just the section they saw was at least 50 feet long, which is enormous. Oh, my word. And he, yeah, and he was able to reference it, like compare it to the lifeboats. They have those 37-foot lifeboats, and this, the portion of what they were looking at dwarfed the, their lifeboats for the ship. So he had something for a good size reference. But, yeah, he said it was like a, like a very smooth, slick-looking skin, like blackish or dark gray, a little bit of, like, flex on it, like a whitish or gray flex here and there. Um, he said that it had a head like a gigantic crocodile or alligator, you know, not as narrow as a croc, a little bit broader, um, a very muscular neck, enormous what he called traps, like, like what looked like its shoulders from there, which could have been its pectoral fins, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, when they were looking down at it, but um, he said, and he even saw it exhale, and when it exhaled, it exhaled, like, below the surface, all these bubbles, like, the water turned white around its head as it came up, and it took a breath. It was very quiet. It didn't blow like a whale with any of that, you know, stuff you'd expect, you know, from a blue whale or a sperm whale or something like that. Um, And if you look it up, I mean, crocodiles and turtles, they don't exhale noisily when they come up. No. You know, which made sense. But, uh, yeah, they said it followed the ship, paced it for, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute, and then eventually it just got bored and it veered off, and it started heading back, he said, in the direction of Miami. This was in the middle of the Gulf, mind you, and whatnot. But uh, from his description, it sounded like a gigantic mosasaur. I mean, enormous. So and it's tantalizing to think that you might have something like that still sneaking around out there, you know? Well, in its mind, it's not sneaking. And it's That's a good true. thing that that cruise ship did not appear edible. Well, so, yeah, you can't do anything to it. something wanted to play with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, a cruise ship is so huge. I mean, yes. compared, you know, it would be like an island moving for, even for an animal that size. I mean, let's say that this thing was real and let's say it was 100 or 110 feet long or something like that. I mean, it's the size of a blue whale. But, you know, blue whales get struck by ocean liners all the time, and sometimes the ship doesn't even realize they've hit them. They're so big. Really? Yeah. yeah my, the ship I was just on was about 1,100 feet in length and weighed, I, I, I don't know, the, the, it was the Disney Fantasy, 130,000 tons or something like that. I mean, they're, they're ridiculously, they're like a city at sea, you know. So, I mean, these, these ships are so big that, God forbid, if they hit an animal, I mean, they've come into port some, several times with a dead 70-foot finback whale draped across the bow, and the ship never knew they'd struck a 70-foot whale until it shows up and there's a dead whale on their nose, you know, when they're well, diving. that is well. Wow. I've been on a small cruise ship, but mm-hmm. not, not a monster one. And I was in the tail end of Sandy, so I wished it was bigger. Yeah. But, um, that was... That was 30 to 50 foot seas. It's like a bass boat that can't get on plane. You know, wow. It was, it was bouncing just like that. It took me a minute to oh. recognize that motion, but <laughs> because it shouldn't have happened on something that big. When it did, it got my attention. I was just kind of like, holy wow. Well, you know, when you have an, like, like, see an animal like that size, when you look at it from a ship, you know, like, yeah, this creature is looking up. It may, maybe it saw people, and it was like, hmm, that'd be a tasty snack. You know, can I jump that high? <laughs> In fact, actually, that happens in one of my books, believe it or not, oh, long before good. I ever talked to, talk to Paul, where, it, uh, you know, a or jumped up and snatched this poor guy off the railing. But, uh, you know, if you were in, let's say, a 36-foot Bertram or something like that, like a fishing boat, this thing would be like Godzilla to you. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be a terrifying experience and encounter. So it's all relative to where you're at. You know, sure. how big the vessel you're on. Can this boat or ship be torn out from under you? You know, I experimented with that in, in my novel where I had like a, a research vessel. You know, the Harbinger was attacked by a pliosaur. And even though mm-hmm. the research vessel was several times the size, once it got rammed repeatedly, it started taking on water and started to sink. And these ships aren't designed to be rammed by something that's 100, 150 tons moving at 40 or 50 miles an hour. You know, it's still going to do damage. Even if the animal hurts itself, it will eventually sink the ship. But. You know, if you're in a small fishing boat and a 60-foot mosasaur comes up to you, you know, you've still got a big problem on your hands. I mean, that's if these things are still alive, you know, there's, it's, it's a terrifying prospect. And 
to them, you're just a tasty morsel that they want to get off that weird floating thing that's not edible. But hey, you look pretty juicy, you know. God well, forbid. You know, that's if it was, if it was in the Gulf. There's a good chance maybe some of that has something to do with disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. Doesn't always have to be electromagnetic. That's true. You know, you know there was actually just last year. Like in this last twelve months or something, I got got to study some footage online. Um, I think it was off of Norway and the orcas there, mm -hmm. and I did a piece on it. You know, where I analyzed some of this footage that a uh, a Facebook page had put up there, and there was a. Uh, it turned out to be a, a young orca, like a calf that was probably only I don't know twelve feet long or something like that. But the, this orca was swimming along, and it was badly injured. Oh. And, uh, yeah, if people go on, like, you know, the, the YouTube page, they can they can see it. But And the orca, at first I thought it was a cow. I mean, it was a female, but I thought it was an adult cow, but it turned out to be a, a calf. And the calf was had first part of its, its, half of its right pectoral fin was bitten off, and it had, like, a big bite mark on its chest. It had a huge bite mark on its dorsal, right in front of the dorsal fin, mm -hmm. like on the hump there, you know and another bite on its ventral area where something had bitten at it and the teeth had ripped away and come loose. And I was looking at these bite marks. I studied the footage repeatedly. It was accompanied by a big bull killer whale that was swimming under it, you know, I guess to protect it or something. Right. But, uh, you know, the, the, the orca was in bad shape. It was, it, had, it was moving very slowly. It had wounds all over it. You could see the white, and you could see all these teeth marks. And the really telling one was the bite mark in front of the dorsal fin because it was very wedge shaped you know if you if you if an orca does not have a bite that looks like that mm -hmm. this was something that had like a triangular head that came down and narrowed and the tooth marks were far apart and they were very jagged you could see where it must have grabbed this orca this young orca and shook it like like trying to kill it or something and the teeth tore back and forth you know as it did this and i showed the uh the stills from it and stuff to one of the top marine biologists in the world who swims with these animals. I mean, this guy has done sonograms of pregnant whale sharks while swimming with them. Okay. That's how oh, hands wow, on. That's he very is. intense. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, I mean, my knee jerk reaction, Max, is that it was other, you know, aggression from another org. He goes, but at the same time, he said, I've never seen marks like that before. You know, so that's he's saying scary. like, you know, yeah, like his like common sense would be like, well, it's got to be this, but the bites didn't match up for a killer whale. You know, it's it's something else. So I, I mean, it seems to me like if you look at the the everything that's out there, it's not a shark bite, it's not a sperm whale. I mean, nothing else matches. The only thing that matches would have been some sort of mosasaur. And I I took like you know like a mosasaur skull and I tried to superimpose it on there and stuff, and it seemed to match. Like the teeth would have lined up. You know, so. If it's possible, so a marine reptile like that attacked this calf trying to you know, wound or kill it and was probably driven off by other members of the pod mm -hmm. and before they finished the job. It may have still died, to be honest, from its wounds or right. from infection or something. I mean, I don't know if, this, if, if it did survive or not. I know they were studying like the, that pod and such, but you know, in the video, it looks in bad shape. It's very thin. You know, like it hasn't been eating properly, and it's just you know, chewed up. I mean, half its dorsal, pectoral fin, I'm sorry, the right one is gone. You know, something grabbed it, bit its chest, and then when it pulled away, it took half the fin with it. Yes. That's not, you know, orca aggression. Orcas don't attack calves typically like that, that at that age, et cetera. You know, um, it's just, what is it? You know, so, I mean, it, it's intriguing that these things, some of them may still be lurking around, you know. Well, it's always a possibility. I mean... There's not really a reason to doubt it just because you can't prove a negative. You know, you just because it hasn't been caught, washed up, mm -hmm. or anything else, there have been sightings all over the world. And yeah, I mean, I, I looked at all, I'm sorry. That's okay. It just... It amazes me, but we actually are at our top of the hour break, and I apologize for interrupting on the the orca because when you said that the 
it was so bad in front of the dorsal, well, wouldn't that have affected its ability to blow, to breathe out? Uh, the, well, the bite is right in front of the dorsal fin, but it's not where the blowhole is. It's where okay. the more muscular area is, like it's the thickest part of its body, right yes. behind the neck. Yes. So. Okay, well, that just amazes me. And we've got all kinds of people in chat, just Sherry especially, is just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't on that cruise ship, for one thing. So we are at the top of the hour. This is a... A news break and you know what you never know we may get a little good news there's always hope so I'm going to go with that hope and just go ahead this is a good time to stretch those legs fill up your beverage container um, throw a few cartwheels forward rolls whatever floats your boat we'll be back with Max Hawthorne here on WBHM digital broadcasting out of Birmingham Alabama you are listening to Fate Mag Radio Thank you. We appreciate that. See you on the flip side. This message comes from NPR sponsor Old Edwards Inn and Spa in downtown Highlands, North Carolina. Savor the holiday season with the comfort and joy spa and dinner package for two. Visit oldedwardsinn.com to plan your holidays in Highlands. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. At midnight, nearly 50,000 United Auto Workers will go on strike against General Motors. Talks this weekend on a new labor contract broke down over pay, job security, and health benefits. UAW spokesman Brian Rothenberg says a strike against GM will have a ripple effect. 48,000 workers that are in the UAW, and you can calculate if you just take seven times that number how many Hundreds of thousands of people are going to be impacted. The UAW wants GM to reopen idled plants and add jobs at others. GM wants workers to pay a greater share of health care costs. Meanwhile, the Teamsters Union says it won't cross picket lines, meaning cars won't be getting to dealerships. Iran is rejecting Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's accusation that Tehran was behind yesterday's drone attacks on two Saudi oil facilities, including the world's largest oil processing plant. NPR Shannon Van Zant has more. Saudi Arabia has not publicly accused Iran of striking the oil plants, but Pompeo has called it an unprecedented attack on the world's oil supply. Iran's foreign minister has denied the charge. Roger Diwan is a vice president at energy consulting firm IHS Markets. It's a very large disruption now, and it will take time to bring on the units who have not been hit, but we know also that a certain number of the critical units have been hit. Saudi Aramco is the state-owned oil giant that runs the refineries. It says production of half the country's daily oil output has been put on hold. Shannon Vincent, NPR News, Washington. The Taliban says they have lifted their ban on the Red Cross working in Afghanistan and that they've given a guarantee to protect, uh, protect Red Cross staff in areas under the Taliban's control. NPR's Dia Hadid has more from Islamabad. In a message sent via social media, a Taliban spokesman said that instructed all their fighters to pave the way for the International Committee of the Red Cross to resume work. The organization is one of the largest working in Afghanistan today. They've faced deadly attacks in the past, including in 2017, when eight workers were killed. The spokesman said they lifted the ban after discussions with the Red Cross in the Gulf state of Qatar. They banned the group from their areas in April, alongside the World Health Organization. At the time, the Taliban said the organizations were carrying out suspicious activities. But there's still no word on whether the WHO will be able to resume its work too. Dia Hadid, NPR News, Islamabad. In Hong Kong, pro-democracy protesters clashed with police throwing homemade explosives at them as police fired tear gas and water cannons. Earlier, they demonstrated outside the British consulate, urging the territory's former colonial ruler to help ensure its autonomy from mainland China. You're listening to NPR News from Washington. The satirical comedy Jojo Rabbit has won the top prize at the Toronto International Film Festival. NPR's Bob Mondello has more. The Grosch People's Choice Award is voted on not by critics, but by festival audiences. And this year, they were in an eccentric mood, selecting an offbeat comedy about a 10-year-old boy in Nazi Germany who has an idiot imaginary friend, Adolf Hitler. Hi, Adolf. 
What's wrong, little man? They call me a scared rabbit. Let them say whatever they want. People used to say a lot of nasty things about me. Still do. Taika Waititi, the film's director, who also co-stars as Hitler, calls Jojo Rabbit a story of tolerance and understanding set in a time that lacked both. Toronto's People's Choice Award has often been predictive of Oscar success. Past winners that also won Best Picture statuettes include Green Book, Twelve Years a Slave, The King's Speech, Slumdog Millionaire, and Chariots of Fire. Bob Mondello, NPR News, Washington. Tropical storm Umberto continues to strengthen, although it is not a threat to land. The National Hurricane Center says it will stay out to sea, dropping a couple of inches of rain on the Bahamas, which are still dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. That storm left at least 50 people dead, and some 1,300 people are still listed as missing. Umberto is expected to create life-threatening surf and rip current conditions along the southeastern coast of the United States from Florida up through the Carolinas that will be happening over the next few days. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio, and I am Kat Hobson, your host. I'm so glad you're here because this first hour has literally just flown by, probably figuratively. But at any rate, it went way too quickly. And we were discussing with our fantastic guest, Max Hawthorne, who, by the way, just happens to be the author of the Kronos Rising series. Sorry about that, Max. I get tongue-tied every so often. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's Happens a brilliant to me every day. series. Thank and you. you also have memoirs of a gym rat. So you are diverse. I like diversity. And I am just blown away by this series. It's a five book series at this point of paleontological fiction. It's fantastic. I'm so glad you did, you did this, and I'm so glad that you're here sharing about it because I love learning, and I did learn reading your books, books, and um, not all of them. I couldn't get through all of them, but I am not slowing down, <laughs> so it just keeps on going. And for those interested, you can go to Amazon.com slash Max dash Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E, and you'll find his author page. And you can get all the books, make sure that you do, and read and find out more about what he has done with this. This is amazing. If you're wanting to chat, you have two options. You can go in your speaker app if you're mobile, search WBHM dash db look for fate radio or fate mag radio we're under both if you are on the website wbhm dash db.com there is a chat icon there you can click and it'll bring you right to our live chat and you can post questions that you may have for max too because goodness knows i have some so welcome back max thank you thank you it's really my pleasure Well, I'm having a ball. Thank you so much for being here because I love your writing and it fascinates me. Thank you. And apparently I'm not the only one. So Yeah, yeah, I have at least 16 avid readers that buy my books. (laughs) And I I love every every one of them. (laughs) But uh, I'm going to call you out there because the page for your books, your Facebook page for your books, has 32,000 likes and goodness knows how many followers. So yeah, they they do you, put up. You've with got me. some readership, and people love it. Your reviews are amazing. Thank you. While we were on break, I actually went on there because I thought the readers. I'm mean, sorry, readers. This shows you what I do for a living. But anyway, I thought your listeners might be interested if they wanted to see that footage about the orca that was all chewed up off of Norway. Um, it's on my YouTube page. I'm not trying to like promote no, self promote. No, I what. want to see that. I know they do. They've been talking about it. 
Yeah, if they go to Max Hawthorne's book trailers and videos, or if they just Google killer whale attacked by living Mosasaur with a question mark on the end, you know, mm-hmm. under videos, there's two parts, part one and part two. It's very crudely made. It's just something I put together myself, you know, at, at home or whatnot. But it does have the, the footage that they can look at. It does have comparisons to extant and extinct species to show, you know, tooth patterns and things of that nature. And, you know, it's, it's very intriguing when you see this footage of this poor orca swimming around with half its fin bitten off and these giant bite marks on it. You know, you just, it, it intrigues you as to the possibility of what could have actually been responsible. So, well, easy to find. I'm planning, I've already written it down, and I will share that after the show in my on my Fate Mag radio page, too, as well as my personal one. But, you know, you said that the bull whale was swimming under it, under her, mm-hmm. trying to help protect her. Yeah, I got the impression, because the, the cow, and like I said, it's a, it's a young animal. It's not an adult, so, uh, I mean, based on its physique, I'm guesstimating it's around 12 feet long or something like that, but uh, it could be a little bigger, I, I mean... I don't know for sure, but the male is significantly larger. You could see he's uh, swimming probably 20 or 30 feet below the the female, and the difference in their their uh, their physiques, their their health, is blatantly obvious. I mean, this is a big bull killer whale, probably 25 feet long, I guess. You know, he's very well fed. You know, they feed on the salmon and such off the coast of Norway. You know, he's athletic looking. He's he's you know in the prime of his life. And this poor female is like, it, it looks like a, a victim that's been like, you know, starved and beaten and abused or something. You know, by comparison, it just, the, the difference in their health or physicality is uh, astonishing. And so my impression, knowing orcas are a very close-knit protective species that live in these in matriarchal family units, is that the, the bull was probably escorting this cow, this young cow, and probably running point or taking point, you know, God forbid if something should come back and try and finish her off. So that's my take on it, of course. Right. That could just be, you know, me projecting or something like that. But uh, and you can see the two of them together in the video there, and it's, it's something to see. Well, I'm going to. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. You know, you you write about these things that that truly are the things of nightmares. The, the experiences of nightmares and such. I saw a blog post, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you want to, to bring this up, because it just goes to prove that there really are aggressive species that you cannot anticipate their reaction or behavior. Just one of my blog posts? Um, I... I'm not positive it's yours, but I think so. Okay. Well, and yeah, I mean, it says uh, well, Amazon best-selling author and book of the year winner, which, by the way, just so people do know, Kronos Rising, Kraken, the Battle for Earth's Oceans, has begun, won the 2018 gold medal from Authors DB, and also the 2016 People's Choice Award book of the year. From Geek Island, and I can't tell you how cool that is. Just saying, putting it out there. But this, I think, is your blog, and it's about your dad and an aggressive alligator. Oh, yeah. You know, they they just did a press release on that a few days ago or something. Because um, they they got these old photos from the actual attack and what. Yeah, I, I'm perfectly fine uh, talking about it and what I, I've I've. I mean, I think, it's a little uh, off the beaten path, but I saw uh, that and I thought, you know, I wonder if he would mind that. No, it's uh, it's an interesting story. It's kind of has a, a funny end to it, I guess you'd say, and what. But um, yeah, this goes back a few years back. I uh, we you know my uh, my family we had a a rental property down in Kissimmee. Um, it was uh, I don't remember the name of the development, but. Um, it had a lake, like a private 12-acre lake there called Lake Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a gated community, you know, big walls all around it. You, you know, it's like trying to get into, you know, a Disney hotel. you got to really 
you know, show ID and all this, but, and they had this lake there. So I figured I was going to fly my dad in so that we were going to take him, you know, out on a nice Florida vacation, doing some fishing, you know, uh, do some of the theme parks, things of that nature, you know, show him a good time. So, yeah, we had this, uh, so having this private lake right behind us, you know, literally if you come out from your lanai, there's, walk down the hill, there's a lake, you know, and it's Florida, and Florida's notorious for big bass and who knows what else in these waters. So I had a couple of rods rigged up and what, and, you know, we got him settled in, and he and I decided to try our luck and, you know, fish the lake. So, uh, you know, we weren't having too much luck at first. We caught this weird walking catfish, believe it or not, which is not a native species, apparently, to Florida. It must be an invasive thing, but uh, I'd never seen a catfish that had whiskers twice the length of its body. It was... I like, haven't either. Yeah, it's, it was insane. I'm like, what is this thing? I had to Google it. But we worked our way around the lake, and we ran into this custodian that worked there, and he was like, hey, y'all be careful. There's a big gator in here, okay? And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, he's a troublemaker you know, fish and game or whatever it was, the wildlife officials had come in like eight times to try and take him out of there. But he said that they, the, the alligator knew the sound of their diesels. And whenever their truck would show up, he would go into the center of the lake in deep water and just hide out and they could never find him. Oh my so, gosh. So, yeah, so that's what so they, they told us. Too. So, yeah, so I'm, okay, it's a 12 acre lake. I, we didn't see any alligator the first day or maybe even the second day. You know, two days passes and you're fishing a couple hours, a couple hours, a couple hours. You start to forget about these things, you know? So we were around the back of the lake, and um, we found a really good spot to fish. Where uh, And when you're, you're taking somebody fishing, the most important thing isn't always catching the giant fish, but it's, you know, having a good time, excitement, and hopefully catching a lot of fish. You know, that, that makes, you know, for a really great outing. Well, sure. So there we're was, going to bed. Oh, no, no, we were fishing from shore. Okay. There's a, this is a private little, you know, like I said, a 12-acre lake. So you, I think it was it got up to like maybe 25 feet deep or something like that in the middle. But uh, don't quote me on that. But, it, you know, it was 12 acres, you know, not a small lake. Um, and so we were, were away on the back, and we found this spot where there was a big storm drain, like a five- or six-foot opening that, I guess, it, when it rained, since I believe this was a man-made lake, the, uh, the water would flow into there if there was, you know, overflow, let's say. Okay. okay. Um, and it was there was a really steep hill right in front of it, but it was a little bit of a patch of level ground you could stand there, and then it kind of you know flattened out, let's say, around the edge there. So my dad had taken up position where he was right next to that storm drain, which meant that behind him was this really steep hill, and I was about maybe ten feet to the right, and we were fishing. We were we had found like uh, there was a lot of reeds out there, and a, a really big school of blue tilapia was loitering in that area right outside this little inlet. So we were casting out right there, and we were getting hookup after hookup after hookup. I mean, we must have caught 25 or 30 of these fish up to 5 pounds before trouble showed up, which was one thing for the alligator, by the way. But uh, so, you know, it was... It was a good time. You know, you're, you're pulling in fish at the fish, and we were just letting them go. Now, that may have drawn the alligator in. I mean, the thrashing of these fish, you know, as they're splashing, you know, a little oh, bit yeah. of blood from the hook being coming out. Who knows what? All I know is I was standing there, and coincidentally, there was a breeze coming in off the water toward me. And this was in December, so I think it was around 75 degrees right now at that point. I'm sorry. Um, and then I looked down. I didn't even look at it. I, I saw what I thought was a big log drifting toward me, you know, because the wind was, you know, pushing it, I figured, and I didn't pay it any mind. Next thing I knew, the log was about five feet away, and it had a mouth that opened oh up with teeth. Oh, my word. <laughs> you know, and the only reason I, he couldn't submerge and get me, really, like, in stealth mode, as they like to do, yes. is because it was the first, like, ten feet or so was pretty shallow. It was only about maybe two, two and a half feet deep there, and the water wasn't opaque. So I saw him coming, but like I said, until he was on top of me, I thought he was a log, you know, then a log had teeth, you know. So I got alarmed, obviously, because he was looking right at me, and I sprang back like six feet, literally, from, you know, I used to do a lot of boxing, so, you know, we're good at springing, let's say, and boom, I jumped back, and I went, Dad, watch out for the gator, like that. And as soon as I said that, he kind of turned at the hip to see what I was talking about, and the alligator saw him, and then it forgot all about me, you know, and if you oh, look yes. at the history of alligator attacks on people in this country, 
most of the time they go after children and senior citizens yes. and women. They want the smaller prey, and they want something that's as feeble as possible. I think my dad was like 79 at the time. You know, he'd had a heart attack years prior. Um, you know, he, he was in no shape to fight an alligator. So the gator, like, saw him, and it was like love at first sight. I mean, it started climbing out of the water, and he was cornered because he couldn't go up the hill, you know, right behind him. It was blocking his exit, and the only other choice was for him to dive into the water where the storm drain was, which would, of course, put him into its its domain, let's say. You know, so it's like when you see, like, you got a couple hundred pounds of alligator coming at you on dry land, your instinct is to get out of dodge, you know, like fight or flight type response, you know. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Steve Irwin, rest his soul, you know, was a god when it came to dealing with these animals, et cetera. But I'm not Steve Irwin. I've never wrestled an alligator. <laughs> I, I hope I to never wrestle an alligator. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it wasn't like this animal where you could sneak up behind it while it was sleeping and jump on its back and then try and hold its muzzle shut. You know, this right. thing was in full attack mode. I was broadside to it. So, you know, I couldn't run because the old man was trapped. And in a few seconds, it was going to grab him by a leg and yank him in the water. And, you know, it would have yeah, been all over. Do what they do. So, yeah, so I looked around, and you know, I'm like, I don't have anything, I don't have anything. And the only thing I had with me was a landing net that I had brought, you know, for fishing. One of those ones that, you know, slides out, like the handle goes through, you know, the hoop or whatever and stuff. It was about five feet long, aluminum, that type of thing. So, fortunately, since I was hoping to catch a big fish, it was a decent-sized landing <laughs> net. <laughs> so I grabbed the net, and I just ran up on the alligator, and right as I was about to go after him, I hit it over the head. Bang! Like that. And I think it was shocked, not expecting this or something. And it dove in the water with a huge splash. Boom! Water flew up everywhere. And it was gone. Or at least we thought. You know? And I was like, I just saved your life. Remember that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you owe me for this one. Okay? Well, he's probably so, like, I just I gave you years a few years ago, uh, right? Yeah, well, we're, yeah, so we're even now. But uh, it's even, even the dogs are getting upset. But... Um, so what happened is, okay, so what happened is, though, about 30 seconds later, like my, my pulse was still going boom, 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 boom. I saw the alligator's eyes and its head sort of break the surface about maybe 20 feet out, and it was looking right at me, you know. And I heard this sound. I have seen those it eyes. Like, it will get you. This, it roared a little bit. It was like this, like, like kind of sound, you know. I, and I knew it was angry. And I was like, oh, here it comes. And I took my digital camera. I turned it on. I tossed it to my dad. I said, take pictures of this. I said, this is going to be good. So the alligator charges me. You know, it was oh not messing gosh. around. Yeah, it, it, you could see its tail churning like a shark's tail. It was like, you know, build up speed. And it came at me full bore, you know, straight at me. Like, and it was all, like, it looked much bigger now because it was all puffed up with air. I, like I said, it was very angry. You know, it didn't like being denied its meal or, you know, I don't know what. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing, once again, like this artificial lake was advantageous because besides the fact it wasn't super deep there, um, there was a little bit of a lip where it came up with the grass, you know, okay. kind of a slight little curve. And this stopped it from just rushing on the dry land at full speed. It had to kind of arc up a little tiny bit, you know, to get up there with, it, with all four feet. And I had no intention of letting it get itself set so that it could charge me. So I flew at it and met it halfway, I guess you'd say. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of these... You know, it wasn't a planned thing, let's say, you know, but so when it, it would hit the embankment, it managed to get its head, chest up to its waist, I guess, if you want to call it that, was out of the water, but not quite the hind legs, you know, and it was like I said, it was hissing and it was very aggressive. And as it did, I flew at it with my trusty landing net. And there were a lot of colorful expletives flying around, which obviously we won't repeat here, you know, heat of the well, moment stuff. But they probably were effective with distracting it with the noise and the motion, too. 
Yeah, I think the motion did most of the distracting, you know, because it, it was a very noisy animal. And so what happens is, is I'm like trying to keep it away from him, my dad, and I'm, I'm hitting this thing over the head, like, you know, lefts and rights and all this other stuff with the net. And it's snapping its jaws and it's trying to get me and I'm like kind of dancing away from it a little bit and whacking it and whacking it. And all the while this is going on, my dad is, you know, saying things like he's, he's eerily calm off to my left. I hear him go, that's it, Max. You got him. Take it to him. Oh Watch my the goodness. teeth. <laughs> you know? Watch the teeth. That was my favorite part, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I think quiet? that's my favorite too so far. Yeah. So I think it w- eventually what happened is I must have hit him in the eye. You know, they have these kind of eyes that stick up a little bit. You know, it didn't hurt his eye because I got a photo of him later and stuff. But I think it stung. And he got annoyed or infuriated more. And he swirled back and he jumped back into the water. And at this point, I think the alligator decided, okay, these two are more trouble than they're worth. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to like, yeah, that, I mean, he, he wouldn't humans. leave. You know, I don't know if people were feeding this thing. And it got used to being given food. And when it showed up and we didn't feed it, it decided we were the food, you know, or what. But, you know, the guy had warned us that it was a problem alligator that was aggressive, you know. But so then it just sort of like surfaced and it was watching us from about 10 feet away, 15 at most, you know, close to shore. I mean, just watching us sideways, you know, like, like, you know, I'll just wait and you'll let your guard down. And then one of you guys is mine. I don't know what was going through its reptilian mind, you know. But uh, so then what happened is it didn't just leave. So we decided, let's keep fishing. And my dad was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, don't worry. I got a net. (laughs) We're safe. I don't think he's going to come after us again. He didn't, but he started stealing our fish. Ah. And so, you know, we'd be hauling in a tilapia. Yeah, and he'd steal it. And he must have purloined five or six big fish in a row. You know, I think I think we managed to get two or three past him by reeling like maniacs and on hooking them and throwing them back or stuff. But this was his shtick at this point. And eventually, I guess he was full. You know, must have eaten 20 pounds of tilapia. And then it just came right up to the shoreline, and he put his chin right on the grass, and he's just lying there, bold as anything, sunning himself right next to me, five or six feet away. I, I swear, I have photos of it. And, but he, he was still aggressive. This big white dog, I don't know what breed it was, like maybe a big Samoyed or something like that, um, that belonged to a neighbor, was not on a leash and was coming down this, you know, like a kind of shallow hill nearby and barking at the alligator. And the alligator wanted the dog. It would get up and start trying to creep on dry land toward the dog. And the dog would bark, bark, bark. And when the gator got a little closer, he would back up and he'd go further up the hill. And the alligator would drop back down and start resting again because he realized he couldn't get him. But this stalking the dog thing went on for like half an hour or something, you know. So, But that's what happened. We called it in, you know, and then I was told the same thing. They said, we'll send somebody, but we've tried eight times. And, you know, every time we go there, we can't find him and yada, yada, yada. They should try harder. (laughs) <laughs> I actually got revenge. We were calling the alligator Spike at this point was the nickname we gave him. And I actually got revenge on Spike the next evening because we went down to the opposite end of the lake. We figured, you know, we're going to be as far away from this troublemaker as possible. And we tried to do a little night fishing. It was just getting dark. We had some live shiners that we were tossing out there. And wouldn't you know, here comes the alligator again. Oh, you my know. gosh. Yeah. This time this, the hill behind us was fairly you know, steep. So we both backed up immediately because we weren't going to like put ourselves in the strike zone, you know? So the alligator, he's like lurking around down there and watching us and hoping we'll come closer. And then he snapped at one of my shiners as I was retrieving it. And I hooked him and he actually it was a bad, oh, so, no. I had a big hook. so yeah, so I had him hooked now. Okay. <laughs> And because uh, tr- I tried to get the shine away from him, and I ended up hooking him by mistake. So the alligator now realizes he's hooked, and he doesn't like it, so he takes off like a missile. I mean, he's like, nee, 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 pulling out, you know, God knows how many yards of line until he stopped. So then I said, you know what, Dad? I'm going to start trying to fish this alligator because he was on there. I mean, he wasn't like, you know, he was hooked. Yeah. So I start bringing him in. You know, this is 12-pound line. So it's not like you can really exert a lot of pressure, you know, get like a couple hundred pounds of angry reptile on the other end. But uh, so I started pulling and I could feel him come up off the bottom, you know, and I started bringing him towards us, bringing him towards us. And I would get him part of the way and then he would take off and take another 30 yards of line. And I'd start bringing him toward us, bringing him toward us. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking like, 
what am I doing? You know, my dad's like losing my mind. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, like, why am I not breaking this thing off? You know, I, I think part of me wanted to, to get even with him for trying to eat us or something, you know, but oh, uh, like my dad was like, you, he's like, you got him. You got him. I'm like, dad, are you serious? I'm like, we got a big alligator. I got a 12 pound <laughs> spinning combo monofilament. I said, we don't have a net, let alone a <laughs> baseball bat or a gun. I said, you know, so even if we get him this far, what are we going to do when he gets here? We can't deal with him or anything. I said, you know, this cannot end well. <laughs> Fortunately, a second later. It's your dad's gun ho. I love it. Yeah. The, you know, like, like, what does he think? I'm like Tarzan or something, you know? So the hook came out a few seconds later and that was the end of it. You know, he didn't bother us again after that. So I think it actually served a valuable purpose of maybe teaching him that maybe people were not on the menu and maybe, mm-hmm. you know, somebody with a fishing rod was not somebody you should just come up to and stalk or something. You know? I don't know. Really? Because but, all of a sudden you become on the menu. <laughs> yeah. But the funniest part though, that I cracked up about was we were back in, in the house and we both needed a beer after this because, you know, I mean, you have a reptile, yeah, it's it's one thing to write about giant marine reptiles swallowing people whole and, you know, battling killer whales and stuff like that. You know, it's different when you have a live reptile, even if it only weighs 200 pounds, you know, trying to grab you and eat you. You know, a charging mm-hmm. alligator is a terrifying sight. Well, no I mean, doubt. And most people don't know that if they get that fourth foot out of mm-hmm. the water and on the land, they've got a 40 mile per hour burst. It's not going to last long, but it will catch you. Yeah, you, you don't want to be on the receiving end of that charge. No. So, so we were sitting there, and we were out, out by the lanai, and we were having a beer. And uh, I was like, Phew. he's like, you're going to remember this for the rest of your life. And I was like, let me tell you, we were very lucky, Dad. And he goes, you tell me? I said, no, no, no. I mean, because we're lucky this thing wasn't, you know, was only a couple hundred pounds and not one of these 800 or 1,000-pound monsters that they have down here. He goes, yeah, could you imagine? I said, no, no, you're not understanding me. I said, you know, I love you, Dad. I said, but if the alligator had been that big, I would have made tracks to Tijuana, and he would have eaten you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, had a puss on his face the rest of the night. He's like, what? I'm like, sorry. I, you know, I'm a family man. I got a child. <laughs> I'm not getting eaten. <laughs> but that anyway. is too funny. I'm sorry. It's I think good. that really is funny. He because, wasn't very happy about that. Sometimes he would just... have eaten you for sure. <laughs> I would have left and you it would have been Dad. Bowie. Yeah. Mm. And and chat, you've got a yep, dude, you need a beer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no really, doubt. what are you gonna do with an eight hundred pound alligator when you hit it with a, an aluminum fishing net? It's like a statue. You know, people don't realize how powerful and how armored these animals are, you know? I mean, like, it would have been like a mosquito. He would have been like, yeah, that's nice. I'm eating your dad, and you're next. You know I mean? Like, so, sacrifices sometimes have to be made. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I would have rescued him for sure. I would have, like, beat my chest, like, oh. Well, Good stuff. I, I was cleaning an island during coastal cleanup, itty-bitty island. And mm. I looked down, and I realized that I was in a nest of some type Mm. and it was an alligator nest or bed or whatever Mm. and i i was shocked (laughs) i i cannot even imagine coming face to face with that yeah an aggressive female protecting her nest that would be you'd be attacked for sure on site i mean like you know that's the their instincts they're incredibly protective of their brood crocodiles alligators you know, I mean, they have, like, in the wild, there are animals, like, Nile monitors and things like that in Africa. And in Florida, you would have, like, raccoons, et cetera, that they're nest raiders, you know. So the, the mother alligator yes. is definitely, if she sees somebody near their nest, no matter who or what it is, she's going to come after you. You were very lucky. Well, I didn't even realize it because I was on the backside of the island away from most of the people. And a guy came walking through, and I was like, I know this is a nest. What is this? And he mm-hmm. just looked at me and he looked around for a minute and he was like, um, you need to come with me. I said, what is it? It's an alligator nest. Mm. And I was like, oh, dear God. And yeah, I'm coming with you right now. I may ride your shoulders just to get out of here, <laughs> you know, but get me out. 
felt like the young Frankenstein, get me out, get me out, get me, you know, on out. So it was disconcerting, completely disconcerting. Have you ever, when you were fishing down in the Caribbean or other areas, is there any Uh, other time that you have come into danger like that? Um, gosh. I mean, the Caribbean stuff, what's interesting there is, like, you could be, like, even in Disney's private island, like Castaway Key, I mean, the, the actual island itself, the lagoon there is quite safe because they have nets to keep out large right. predators. But, uh, you know, you go beyond that, and it's like a smorgasbord. I mean, we were bottom fishing, just catching, like, small, you know, two-foot fish, but pretty soon, hordes of big predators showed up, and it was impossible to not end up fighting something enormous. I mean, you, you Caribbean reef sharks that are 10 feet long, huge grouper, barracuda. I mean, they were just everywhere. You know, if you, if you hooked a fish and you didn't reel like a maniac and try and get to the surface, and even sometimes then, you would end up fighting something enormous with tackle that really wasn't designed to deal with something big and with a lot of teeth. You know, so I had like sharks on 10, 20 minutes and then they'd finally bite through the line or, you know, they were well hooked. It would like saw through from their skin on their fins and whatnot, you know. So, I mean, in, very, very dangerous. But I think the, the one of the closest calls I've had would be fishing out of New Jersey, believe it or not. I think it was out of the mud hole. And we went out to do a shark fishing trip and uh, there was a big storm coming in. And we shouldn't have been out there because... You could see it. You could see the, the front coming, advancing, and all the other boats were rushing in. We were the only idiots going out. You know, it's kind of like looking at the captain, like, "Are you sure this is a good idea?" Like, oh yeah, yeah, we got time. So what happened is, um, when you're shark fishing out there, you set up what's called a chum line. You know, they have like a, maybe a perforated bucket filled with frozen like fish parts and blood and things like that and it it falls you know it creates this slick that could be miles long and the sharks will follow the slick and eventually hopefully find your bait so we were set up for this and it was very choppy out there because there was you know there was a storm coming um so i would say we probably already had like four to six foot seas which you know in a 28 foot aqua sport you know you're getting tossed around a bit already so everybody else was on the port side i was on the starboard by myself and I remember I was, like, leaning on the gunnels and looking out to see if there was any fins out there and whatnot. Right. And all of a sudden I realized that, like, the horizon had disappeared. And I was like, what am I looking at? And it was, like, turned to be a wall of water. And what had happened was an enormous wave had come up broadside to us. And I looked up, and the wave – now, I'm six foot one. I was standing on the deck. And the wave was – at least six feet over my head. Broadside. To figure, you know, you know, it was at least twelve feet from, from you know, from the, uh, the trough. And all I had time to yell was "rogue wave" at the top of my lungs, and then it smashed over the boat. And I, I was underwater, like you know, holding on to the gunnels as the wave crested over the boat. The whole boat turned on its side. You know, I heard like the screaming and the crashing and all this other stuff like that. It practically filled the boat, you know, and then it kept on. The, the boat thankfully did not completely capsize. It turned right okay. side up. It was very buoyant. Yeah, and everybody was drowned and everything was destroyed. And you know, the the water starts coming back out of the boat. They have like, drainage and whatnot, but. uh yeah, it was a, a frightening experience because we came very close to ending up in the drink in a capsized, with a capsized boat, you know, with yeah, a storm generally. coming. Yeah, and with sharks in the water around us. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you put yourself, you're, you're basically saying, hey, I'm bait. Hey, hi. You know, I'm who you're but, looking uh, for. Follow that trail. Yeah, but I seem to have a guardian angel that keeps me from harm over and over again. So, you know, what are you going to do? Well... Just keep going out. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> and if you want something you funny, get farther than they can fly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I got a funny story for you. I, I wasn't really in danger though, but I think it was the last time I went. I was at Bucky again. The last time I went Goliath grouper fishing, and the largest grouper that I've landed, which and held for a picture before we let it go, was about four hundred and sixty pounds was the estimate, which is a sizable fish. I mean, big enough to eat a child, God forbid. But. uh so we were fishing these pilings by, out of Port Charlotte, 
you know, they used the old phosphate docks, I guess, and stuff. Yeah. And uh, the, the the captains are really slick when it comes to, like, catching these fish, especially when the tide's moving. They will actually, like, anchor up right with their stern, you know, like maybe, I don't know, 30, 50 feet from the docks or something, the pilings, and they'll put bait down there, and these huge grouper lurk in and around the pilings. And they'll rush out to grab a bait, but once they're hooked, they'll you know, drive back into the pilings and they'll try and wrap you up or break you off or something like that. And they're incredibly powerful. I mean, I've had 500-pound steel cable snapped, you know, huge hooks with, with steel as thick as your pinky broken in half. I mean, it's astonishing. But uh, on this particular day, we were using stingrays for bait. And uh, a big grouper will swallow, a, you know, a two-and-a-half or even a three-foot-wide stingray like it's nothing. They suck them right down. Right. You know, it's a very popular bait for these things. We had to had um, one stingray that they brought in that was much too big to be used for bait, and the captain had cut it into sections. So he took off like a wing that weighed like 15 pounds and used that, and we caught like a 300-pound grouper. And then he used the other wing, and we put it down there, and we caught a 275. Eventually, we were out of bait, and we were having a bang-up day, and the only part left of the obviously dead stingray was the core of the body and the tail, you know, the head, we'll call it the, you know, the trunk, the tail, you know, the long the stinger and the bulging eyes on the top. And this piece, he said, well, they're not going to eat that. They, they don't like that. I said, well, it's all we got. So let's give it a shot. So he hooks it with this enormous hook between the eyes. And you're talking, this thing looked like steak on the side. It was about, I'm going to say eight or 10 inches thick, bloody steak on each side. It was like a 30-pound slab of meat with a tail on the end, okay? And so he dropped it down. We had now, at this point, we had our bow to the uh, the pilings, and I lowered it down, and he said, just twitch it a little, you know, like, you know, make until you feel the hit. He said, then we're going to pull them out. So when you do that, you feel them take the bait, and then the captain guns the engine in reverse as hard as he can. What he's trying to do is not just helping you set the hook, but he wants to pull that huge fish away from the pilings so that he can't hang you up and so you can fight him in the open, which is your only chance. Okay, that's what you want to do. So I put this huge slab of bleeding, bloody meat down there, and I jig it, boom, boom, and I feel it gets taken. I'm like, okay, and he's like, nothing. He dropped it. Try it again. Get back in position, drop it down, jig, 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 go. He drops it three times. And then I'm like, Bucky, this is an experienced fish. You probably hooked him before or somebody has, et cetera. He knows what's going on. We need to give him time to eat. And he's like, no, because if we do that, we're going to get hung up. We've got to take a break. We have to take a break. I am so sorry because I am dying to hear this, but we will be right back. Everyone else come back to you. This is, I love smart fish. We will be right back. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. In today's breaking news, over 1.8 million people have signed a petition that is circulating throughout social media and online pledging to raid Area 51 in hopes of freeing any extraterrestrials that could be on site. Also seeking full disclosure from the U.S. government. Could anything actually come of this? What could be the outcome? Find out on our continuing coverage at 9 p.m. here on WBHM DB Action News. <laughs> You're kidding, right? Most of those people couldn't rate a refrigerator if it weren't for it having a light in there. How about this? For some real information that you can use, instead of the other, um, sources, stay here where you are on WBHM, DB, Birmingham, Alabama. 
Abnormal Alabama presents Crypticon October 25th and 26th at the Board of the Wharf, Orange Beach. Bigfoot, the paranormal, authors and speakers, vendors, and your chance to experience the Psychomantium. There'll be a costume contest and much, much more. October 25th and 26th at the Board of the Wharf, Orange Beach. Get more info, directions, and tickets available now at abnormalalabama.com. That's abnormalalabama.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and my guest is Max Hawthorne. Max has written the award-winning series, Chronos Rising, and it is a five-book series. You You've got to read it. You can find him on Amazon.com slash Max dash Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E. And I'm here to tell you that his experiences that led up to his interest in the topic to get these books out are what we've been discussing tonight. And he is fascinating. And I interrupted him as he was sharing an experience with a Goliath grouper. So, Max, I apologize, but as I said, I love smart fish. Yeah, well, this this fish was definitely uh, edu- educated. <clears throat> College graduate grouper, <laughs> without a go. doubt. So, so what happened is, is that Bucky was afraid that the grouper was going to hang us up, you know, in the pilings. I think we were using, like, 200-pound test power pro was the line. It was the same rod and reel he used to catch his world record shark on, in fact. In fact, the same smelly shoulder harness that he never washes. <laughs> Wa- it's like one of those sumo guys with the, those things that they wear that they never wash. I mean, seriously, what's wrong, dude? Come on. But anyway, it smelled so bad. So I had the shoulder harness on. And um, so, you know, I'm sitting in this little fighting chair in the bow of his 19-foot boat and trying to, you know, jig this, you know, grouper into like, you know, d- committing, let's say, Okay. So I did it again, boom, 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 boom. And he's waiting to gun the engine, and I don't want him to because he's going to scare the fish off and stuff. And I feel it hit, and I, it's like, chug, 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 And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And then I went, now. And boom, he puts it in reverse, and he, will say, floors it, if you know what I'm saying, with an outboard or whatever and stuff. And it's like this roaring battle to pull this thing away from the pilings down to the open. And we managed to do it, and I'm holding on, and I can tell. This is a larger fish than any grouper I've ever dealt with down there. You know, I'm, I'm holding on and I'm cranking as I can and stuff. And within a few seconds, this thing comes to the surface. And it turns out, I'm looking at it, I'm like, what am I staring at? You know, it, it looked like a brown killer whale lying on its side as it oh. came to the surface. Yeah, with, with the bait in its mouth. And I'm looking at it and the, the fish was not actually hooked. It was so angry at the stingray that it thought it was, uh, was alive that as I was watching it, it was crushing it with its jaws. It was like crunch, crunch. It wouldn't let go, but the part with the hook was right outside of its mouth. It wasn't, you know, the hook oh, wasn't actually goodness. in the fish, you know? And what happened is, and I'm, I, I was fascinated because this grouper was eight feet long. I've never seen a grouper that size. Get I have no idea. Like, eight feet? Eight feet long, wow. big enough I've to eat a grown person. That big. And it was lying on its side, and it turned. And I, I, I told this story to a friend of mine. If you remember Andre the Giant, mm-hmm. you know the wrestler, and how he would like look down at somebody with this like side eye, like really intimidating stare of his. Indeed. Well, this fish, which was much bigger than Andre, did that to me. You know, it gave <laughs> me this nasty look, and I was like, uh, uh. And then it just went woof, and it dove. I mean, the tail was three feet across, and it just into the depths and left the bait. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Before it did that, it yanked its head sideways, and it threw the stingray at me. It almost landed in my lap, hit me in the legs, and landed on my feet. This 30-pound oh, disgusting slab of yeah, raw meat. Okay, And then it turned, and it crashed down and it, in deep, and it just took off, and it was gone. You know, And, and Bucky was like... Did you see that? And I'm like, dude, 
uh, it was at my feet. You know, I'm a lot closer than you. He was back on the polling platform or whatever it was back there, you know. But, I mean, it was just gigantic, you know. It really, like, an, an amazing sight. And then I remember telling him, because he, he was like, they, they changed the laws then, where at that point now you were no longer at, able to take a grouper out of the water, you know, to pose for pictures, you know, so they don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to, like, take the hook out while it's in the water or whatever and, you know, this type of thing. So he was like, you know, we could have took him into the shallows and put a jaw rope on him and held his head up for a picture. And I'm like, nah, I said, I don't want to do that. I want to get, like, under and put my hands under his belly. And, like, so all you see is my head and, like, a sideways shot. You know, like, look, Mom, like this. And he looked at me, he shook his head, he went, yeah. He goes, they bite. Good luck with that. <laughs> He's right, <laughs> you know? they do. And they have teeth, too. So, you know, I, I, I could have been killed by that thing. But, uh, you know, but that's, it's those type of fishing adventures and experiences that really the adrenaline rush, the, the, uh, the physical experience of, you know, man versus monster, whatever you want to call it, you know, everything that's involved. If you're going to write about adventures on the water, and I mean, whether you're writing about marine monsters like I do or anything else, you know, it lets you bring an added layer of realism to your writing. You know, that suspension of disbelief that I harped on earlier. You know, I mean, I, I, I've read books that people you know, have written where you think to yourself, has this person ever been on a boat? You know, have they ever fished? I, I remember one, one novel where a guy was in a fighting chair and some huge sea monster grabbed his bait or something and pulled on it so hard that the fighting chair was ripped up out of the deck of the boat and over the side with a screaming angler in it. And I, I read this and I'm like, I had to like go back and read it and make sure I, I understood what I read, right. you know, before I, because first off, if you've ever been in a fighting chair, the fighting chair, you're not chained to the chair. No. You're sitting in the chair and typically what's called a bucket harness. And the bucket harness is like, like you wrapped around your hips and your rear end and it's got you know, cables and it, or belts, and it connects to the lugs of the reel. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So you're connected to the rod. So in a situation like that with a huge powerful fish, it's possible you could be pulled up out of the fighting chair and catapulted over the side. You could. I'm sure it's happened. You know, I'm it's sure a dangerous. It I've, yeah, I've stopped people. For, uh, you know, my, my wife, who was then my girlfriend, it almost happened to her three times. I kept pulling her back in the chair, pulling her back in the chair. <laughs> you know, so. You know, that if, if in a situation like because that... Because she was a keeper. What, yes, exactly. Actually, the, the wedding band says catch of a lifetime inside. Oh, oh, I love it. Oh, my God. But anyway, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be telling me these things. So, you know, in a situation like that, it's like you read this and you're like, what is... what? I don't you know. Like, the last possible thing that would happen would be a fighting chair that's bolted into the frame of a boat, be pulled out by 200-pound test line or even a 400-pound test line. It would take... Tons and tons and tons of pressure, even if the line was attached to the fighting chair, which it never was. You see what I'm saying? So when you hear, read stuff like this, you're just like, you know, it comes in handy where you can write a scene like that and make people believe that they're experiencing it, you know? And I did that actually in my first novel where you, you must have read it, where uh, the guys were out tuna fishing and the old man was in a fighting chair and they had an 11-pound blue fin on there estimated Mm -hmm. and it gets taken by some huge unseen thing which they of course assume was a great white or something like that you know because they don't know that there's a pliosaur swimming around (laughs) and so what happened is is when the fish was taken you know you want to make it as realistic as possible so the first thing i did was the guy's like help 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 and his nephew grabs his uncle in a bear hug around the back of the chair and holds on to him for dear life so that he doesn't get pulled overboard. Yeah. And then what happens next is the rod starts to self-destruct. You know, the guides start to pop off, boom, 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 you know, the roller guys and stuff like that, line screaming out, and then boom, it goes slack, and they go flying, you know, because the line got bitten through. So that's what would realistically happen in a situation like that. And I've been in situations like that, so I know. See, So when you have these type of watery, these marine adventures, it's very conducive to creating a realistic environment for your reader where they feel like this just happened to me. And if exactly. you can pull that off successfully, yeah, then, then, you know, you, you're good at what you do. And Not you to take are. away from anybody else, but you know, if you're going to write something, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to research, you know, you can't just like wing it because then like I've experienced people will try and come at you with, 
you know, like, oh, well, technically a submarine would not have that type of engine because of, you know, and you're like, uh, here we go. <laughs> there are always those types. Yeah, you know, uh, I want to see somebody write a 200,000-word novel, you know, and, and then come at you and, and, and criticize. I mean, that's, you know. Well, especially when it's something that you are writing from experience, and I don't care who you are. There's always a possibility that something will go awry. You'll miss, well, not misspeak, but miswrite, or you'll get words twisted. And that's what editors are for. Right? Uh-huh. That's what friends reading your PDF file are for. But it oh, is, my... mm-hmm. you know, it's just amazing to me that that somebody would be so harshly critical. My editor on my last novel that came out, and by the way, volume six is due out shortly. So there will soon be six books in the series. Thank you. But he actually, like, saved me from, I don't know if it was the hugest mistake in the world, but it would have been something I would have been called on. Um, There was a scene in in my last novel, Cronus Rising Crack, in volume two, if I'm not mistaken, where... Uh, this captive elephant is being transported to this research facility, let's say, and it's a dangerous animal, a rogue elephant, very large, and it's in this big steel box. That's a way that they transport it on the back of like a tractor trailer, and then they put it on this boat, and the boat gets to the island. So when it got there, there was a crane that would be used to pick up the container that the animal was in and put it on the back of a rail car so that it could go into the mountain into the side of the facility. Mm-hmm. So I do extensive research on everything I do and our construction for this, you know, box and all this other stuff. And, but I did not have any experience in terms of cranes and steel cables lifting rail cars up and things of that nature, you know? So my, estimate of how long each of the cables would have been, you know, like there were one on each corner, so four of them coming together to this attachment point, you know, for the crane to lift, you know, was off. And the, I also didn't know what they call these assorted pieces that connect everything together, et cetera. It turns out my editor at some point actually worked in that environment. And he was like, Max, yeah, he said, these cables are too small. He goes, too short. He goes, at that size, he goes, they would snap with the sheer force, magnification, start explaining a technical aspect. I'm like, wow. You know, so we had to adjust those. This would be here. This, these are called this, this, that, that. And it was, like, fascinating. And what are the odds that an editor, you know, when he got out of the Army, was working in the docks, you know, decades ago and would learn all this stuff, and it was an invaluable contribution, you know, to my book. Just the right odds. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's, like, meant to be. And, yes, you know, so. Is. Thank you, my friend. I need for you, if you wouldn't mind, to let Mm -hmm. people know where to find you. I've given out your Amazon link several times, but how else can they reach out to you? Um, Well, I mean, I'm just starting on Instagram, and I really don't do much on Twitter. Most people who try and get in touch with me either can reach me through my author's website, which is either... Max Hawthorne with an E on the end dot com. So www.maxhawthorne.com. Um, it's also uh, cronusrising.com would take you there as well. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can reach me. I mean, I have a personal page, although I'm, not, I'm a little bit of a recluse. Um, but the Max Hawthorne's Cronus Rising novel series page is the main fan page. And I have a couple of people. Um, editors and such that run the page and take care of things. And, you know, if somebody wants to reach out to me, get a message, et cetera, they can do it that way, or they can do it through the site. There are links on there to do that. Um, there's also, not to sound like a salesperson, but if people are, are on the main, I mean, on the website, there's a free books section there, and you can go in there and you can download free excerpts from all the novels, including that tell-all memoirs of a gym rat, which I don't talk about much, but it's a sordid tale, but anyway. Um, and if they have certain, like, uh, subscriptions with Amazon, mm-hmm. they can actually read the Kindle versions for free with a lot of the books, too. So it's good stuff. That is cool stuff. And I have to tell you that I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I knew when I was reading your work that there were there was all kinds of back layers to your experiences that were giving you this knowledge. I enjoyed that. 
Thank you for Thank sharing. You. It was it. my pleasure. Oh, it was my pleasure. I enjoy rambling on and on. I, I don't get out much, <laughs> you know, working from home all the time. So when I do get to talk, my my daughter's always saying how I never shut up, you know, in public. I'm embarrassing. I ramble on, blah 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 blah. It's She's your always job. embarrassed. Yeah, embarrassing our children. You know, it's it's a career. It's a gift. Yes. And I'm very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, eventually they'll get us back. So That's true. Thank you again for being here. And our chat rooms have been so active and having so much fun with you. So thank you all for that, too. I do want to let you all know that we are back on our regular schedule. So tomorrow night will be Denise Pridemore with the Paranormal Pride. I will be back Wednesday night with... Paranormal Experienced Radio with my guest, Josh Hurd. Friday night is going to be Paraversal Universe, followed by Ghost Talk Radio. And then I will be back next Sunday, and I'm going to have two different, two separate guests, one for the first hour, one for the second. I almost never do that, so this is going to be a rare treat, too. And... Thank y'all so much for being here. You know, y'all are the reason we do this. And go out in there. Be the change that you want to see in the world. We all have the ability to manifest that. And you can affect it. You can affect anything that you want to focus enough energy and attention on. So make the world a better place. We got to. It's the only one we've got, right? So thank y'all again for listening. Thank y'all in chat for some great questions and the fantastic comments. And Max, thank you again for joining me. I appreciate that. It was my privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You have been listening to Fate Mag Radio. Have a great week.